Happy Sabbath, everyone. I pray that we have had a blessed week. We are gathered in God's house this morning to give Him praise and glory and honor. So this morning as we begin, let us all stand as we pray before we begin. We are praying. Kind and merciful Father, Lord, we humbly come before you this day, this Sabbath day of rest. We thank you, dear Lord, for the many blessings throughout the week. And Lord, maybe some of us are here this morning feeling sick, feeling tired, feeling weary. Lord, we pray that you give us strength. For those who are home watching online, we pray that the Holy Spirit visit them where they are even now. And we pray as, we, as the praises go up, the blessings will come down. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll be singing from our church hymnal, the old hymnal. And we'll begin with hymn number 453. They come from the east and west. We're watching from all over the world this morning, wherever you may be, in America, in St. Lucia, in Argentina, they come from the East and West. We are worshiping the Lord together this morning. They come from the East and West. They come from the North.
Oh 
Our opening song is number 254, The Great Physician. <laughs> us up this morning. We thank you for bringing us here safely, Lord God. We thank you for your traveling mercies, Lord God. Many people didn't see today. Lord, we ask you to help us overcome the giants in our life, whether it may be financial, health, or other struggles in life. Lord, give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in everything we do. Help us to share your word as our time on earth is getting shorter. In your name I pray, amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In order to succeed through life, one must be able to face the challenges that they encounter on a daily basis. 
Depending on how we face those fears will determine if our giants are being faced or feared. Today is one step closer to facing those giants. This is the best time to either learn, to start learning, to either learn or start learning how to face them. And so, Sabbath School welcomes you to learn to do so. You are magnificently welcome and be blessed. Our scripture reading is taken from Isaiah 41, verse 10. And it says, fear, fear thou not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with thy right hand, with thy right hand of my righteousness. This is the word of God. Brother Arthur to do a special song for us. Amen. Morning, church.
Amen. I would like to thank God for using Brother Arthur to bless us this morning. This morning, I will talk about facing your giants. Sorry, good morning, church. Now, it's easy to talk about giants as long as they're lumbering over someone else's landscape, right? But when you find them at your doorstep or even discover that one has invaded your home, or more dangerously come inside your head, you realize how intimidating a giant can be. They have several names. There's a giant called fear. Even though most of us don't want to admit it, most of us entertain fears. Whatever may be your giant, let me tell you, I've learned giants work most effectively in valleys. When we have hit a valley, that's when the giant begins to start marching towards us and intimidates us the most. There is a giant that appears in the pages of scriptures in the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. A story, have, a story you have heard since you were a child. We read in verse 2 of 1 Samuel 17 that Saul and his men, the men of Israel, had gathered and camped in the valley of Elah. What makes the valley intimidating is not the landscape. It's the presence of a champion. He's called out more than once in this chapter. In fact, the emphasis always talks about the externals of giants. In this case, we read that the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and Israel stood on the other side and the valley between them. Then a champion came out from the army of the Philistines named Goliath. I know you know the story and I know you're familiar with where I'm going. But I want to ask you for a few moments to put yourself in that valley. Imagine being across, imagine being across the way and seeing this huge, imposing individual full, in full armor. We read that he was about 9 feet 7 inches tall. He said, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down and fight me and kill me and we will become your servants. And we read that they were intimidated to the point in verse 11 that they gave way to dismay and fear. See it? Greatly afraid. There, is, there he is for everyone to see. He's a warrior from his earliest years and he's nobody to mess with. And Israel knew it, and all retreated to the tent. Now suddenly, the text moves us about 10 to 15 miles due east to a little hamlet named Bethlehem. And there in Bethlehem, there is a family, and the father, whose name is Jesse, says to this young man, David, um, I want to take this to those who are in battle. And he gives him some, ply, some supplies and food. Now David sees the situation for the first time, and he sees Goliath. David, who is unintimidated, fresh out of the field, a lover of God, and an individual with a pure heart. Now listen to Saul. Saul said to David, you're not able to do it. He said, you're nothing but a youth, and he's been a warrior from his earliest years. Little David said, what a wonderful way to deal with giants. As the Lord delivered me from the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, oh, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. He chose five stones from the brook and placed them in his shepherd's bag, which he had. And we read he approached the Philistine. David stands there with the stones rattling in the bag in his, on his hip, and a stone in his hand. And David says to him, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, 
I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. Verse, five and, verse 50 and verse 51, David puts his hand in the bag, took from it a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him and brought the head to Jerusalem. And notice in verse 54, he put the weapons in his tent, David's tent. Let's not go too quickly over this wrap-up of the battle. That's significant. What else is in David's tent? How about the paw of the bear? How about the mane of the lion? Just a reminder of those lion, bear, and Goliath moments when God brought a victory through David. Never forget your lion and bear stories, your giant stories. Every one of you have some. I have some. I will say to you, don't forget what God has done for you. As a little cliche, count your many blessings. You can put it that way, but think of them as God's power working through your life. Never forget your lion and bear stories. Remember that magnificent, impossible situation that God turned around for you. Remember that prayer Remember that prayer you offered in a weak faith, and by the grace of God, he answered. Following every giant victory, place a reminder in your mental trophy case. When the crucial, the crucial moment arises, remember these five words. The battle is the Lord. Oh, yes. The day you take on a giant in your own flesh is the day you will face defeat. Yeah. All the way through this episode, this brief battle, David's focus was on the Lord his God. No wonder he's called a man after God's own heart. Everybody else focused on the giant. David realized that his God is greater than any giant. Amen. There is no giant so great that he is not greater still. Amen. 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 Let us offer a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we want to thank you for the different things you have done in our life. Thank you, Father God, for showing us that you are still very first no matter what. Help us, Father God, that when we are placed in a situation, help us to call upon you. Help us to know how great you are, Father God. Help us to see how great you are. Help us to put our trust in you no matter how big situations may seem, Father God. Continue looking after us throughout the Sabbath, and I pray that you allow us to draw closer to you and depend on you more. In your Son, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Good morning, saints of God. Good morning, brothers and sisters. All right, so we'd like to welcome you once more to the Balata SDA Church. 
This is a moment of study. What do you say? It is a good thing for God's people to gather together to study the word. And this morning, brethren, we just like to welcome those who are viewing online. We have folks, I heard the song being sung, they come from the east and west. So I know that there are folks from the east, the west, and from the south, which I'm from, who are watching with us, so would like to welcome you at this moment as we study the word of God. Before we continue, we'd like to offer a word of prayer, so let me invite the church to please bow your heads with me as we pray. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Our loving Father, this morning, Lord, as we gather in your presence, we'd like to thank you, Lord, for the gift of sight. We'd like to thank you, Lord, for the gift of reading, for the ability to open the scripture and to search them. But most importantly, Lord, we'd like to thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, the one who helps us to understand your mission for our lives. Today, as we gather in your presence, we pray, Lord, that you would give us the gift of your spirit, that we will understand your word and it will be applied to our life. I pray, Lord, in a special way that you will touch somebody's heart. There is somebody here in the congregation and somebody who's online, who's watching, Lord, who expects to receive a message from you. Please, Lord, disappoint us not. Thank you for what you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our sister just spoke about, about um, the end time, end time giants. Okay. End time, well, um, giants, sorry, the giants that we face. But today we are focusing on end time deceptions. Now, if you look at giants, giants are obvious. Is that not clear? If you're walking down the road and you see somebody that is seven feet tall, it is obvious that you'll see somebody that is massive. And that person is away from the norm. But our lesson focuses on something that is deceptive. It looks normal, almost. If you look at it across the board, the spectrum of humanity, it looks like every other thing. But there is something that is different about it. And this is what a deception is. And that's what, that's what we're going to focus on um, as we look at our lesson. Our scripture reading um, this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14 and 15. The Bible says, And no wonder, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. In other words, the Bible is telling you, um, pasote, you know, do not be surprised for Satan who in the movies, have you ever seen the depiction of what evil is in the movies? If they had to depict Satan, how would his head look? He would have horns, right? He would have fangs, he would have a pitchfork and maybe a sharp pointy tail. The devil looks gruesome on, Hollywood, on the Hollywood screen. However, the Bible is telling us something here. The Bible is telling us Satan disguises himself as a what? An angel of light. So it is not strange, this is important, if his ministers also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. The Bible goes on to say, the end will match their deeds. Now, those of us who studied would realize that the lesson takes us through some end time deceptions that have to do with the root and the foundation of Genesis chapter 3 verse 4. Where Satan responded to Eve and told her, you shall not surely die. So let me just read a little bit and then we'll go into Sunday's portion of the lesson. Our contemporary world has become a melting pot of the supernatural and the mystical, helped, by, helped on by Hollywood, which has no problem making movies with religious and mystical themes in a hodgepodge of error and deception. The old lie, you shall not surely die, also has inspired some of the most read books and, watched movie, and most watched movies of the past few decades. And many popular video games as well. 
undeniably, we are exposed to and tempted by the enchanted grounds of Satan, which can appear in myriad forms and even, in some cases, can come hidden under the veneer of science. So you see, brethren, Satan, and we have to just spend a little moment there, God was very clear, because this serves as a foundation for the entire lesson. God was very clear. God told Eve and Adam, when you eat this fruit, you shall surely die. You will die. And then, when Satan came in, Satan told them, God had made a mistake. Now, I will tell you, there are many people who teach and believe secretly that they have a knowledge that is greater than the Bible. Their knowledge, their secret knowledge is greater than the Bible. And it reveals some things that the Bible has that is missing. And we'll go into that this morning as we cover mysticism. Okay? So Sunday portion covers mysticism. And let me just read a little bit. It says, the phenomena can vary in forms and intensity. But the tendency always is to replace the authority of the written word of God with one's own subjective experience. Now, sometimes when we think of mysticism, and it covers a, a wide spectrum for true, but, you know, some people, and sometimes we say it out of an honest and, you know, wholesome heart, and you say, my God will never do this, and my God will never do that. But what we're supposed to be founded on is not our impression of what God will and will not do. All right? What our faith is founded on is what the word of God says. So what God says in his word, that he will do. Let me give you an example. There are some people who believe that God is so loving that he will not destroy the world with fire. So they say... My God is too loving. He will never destroy the world with fire. But as, as soothing and as calming and as, as well-intentioned as they may be, is that founded on the word of God? So we'll go into Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21 as we read a few verses here. The Bible says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say unto me in that day, meaning the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, have we not, have we not what? Prophesied. Do you know what it means to prophesy? It means, brethren, that you are speaking of something that will happen in the future. So some people will come to God on the day of judgment. Now there is some imagery here, but the message is still clear. Lord, how is it that I did not make it to your kingdom? I was saying things that was coming to pass in the future, that would have come to pass. Which means, brethren, that those things are not a true indication that somebody is walking with God. You cannot say that if somebody prophesied, because I'll tell you, even in St. Lucia, we have people who have come here who have claimed to prophesy of what will happen in the future. So that is not um, in and of itself a merit for whether that person will make it to the kingdom. It also goes on to say, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. All those things are good. But brethren, it goes on to say, and I, I like this part of the scripture, and then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, he that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth the sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him as a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded on a rock. Now, this is very profound. Starting from Genesis onwards, we realize that the rock represents who? The rock represented Christ. Sakadinu me 
that nous la foi nous la foi nous aussi poser bâtir les qui moun en les Jésus et et parole Jésus so c'est pas juste ça nous croire c'est pas ça l'église nous dit nous c'est pas ça pasteur dit mais c'est ça bible a dit our, our, whatever we say or whatever we whatever we believe in it must be founded on the word of god is that clear brethren so then it tells us that there's a strong tendency in the postmodern Christian world to downplay the relevance of biblical doctrines. If you notice that, and a lot of the modern day, very popular YouTube preachers and so forth, they don't really focus too much on doctrine. They focus on feelings. So they tell you, you know, and it's amazing to listen. So when you listen to those sermons, honestly, you feel good. You feel good. You know, they, um, they speak concerning, you know, the trial in your life and whatever, whatever. And it seems like a very good motivational speech. Now, there is a place for that. Are you listening to me, brethren? There is a place for that. But biblical doctrine is what will keep us away from being deceived. Remember, our scripture focuses on what Satan will look like in the end times. So, let's say we have an image of Satan in our minds, and we all know the image that we have of Satan. But here comes a man to St. Lucia, Elder Doles, and he is an angel of light. Come on, think about it seriously. And when he comes to St. Lucia, he tells Philip Pierre, I want to have a meeting with you. St. Lucia is going through too many trials at this moment. He goes on to say that we are having too many gun violence, you know, and too many murders and too much um, 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 theft and so forth. And he's speaking all the nice words. And he tells Philip, Philip Pierre, I want St. Lucia to return to Jesus. Is that bad? But then he goes on to say, now I'll be real with you this morning. He goes on to say, to go back to God, we all must come together on Sunday coming and have a big service of prayer. We want to pray for our nation. You see, sometimes we look at Bible prophecy and we do not apply it to our context and what will actually happen in the last days. The Bible tells us, brethren, that Satan will be an angel of light. And he will heal, and he will bless, and his voice will be melodious, and he, the world will be in rapture of his awe. And then, there will be a set of people on the side who are saying doctrine is important. While, while this angel of light is over here, telling everybody, come on, let us come together. Let us worship together. Let us love the Lord together. You have a set of people on that side that saying doctrine is important. What do you think the world will do? Be real, brethren. What do you think the world will do? The world will have a problem with those people that are saying that doctrine is important. Let's move on. Near-death experiences. Now, this man, Raymond A. Moody Jr., in his book, Life After Life, says, like he carried out a study, right? He had a five-year study, and he studied more, more than 100 people who experienced clinical death. Now, I just wanted to say the difference between clinical death and actual death. So, from this particular webpage, it's pretty much the same across the board, a person is declared, clinic, um, declared clinically dead when blood circulation and breathing completely stops. The difference in the case of declaring someone legally dead is that resuscitation is not possible. Now, the Bible gives us experiences from many people who are dead. And you know, there's one that we often forget. Do you know that Elisha was buried? And where Elisha was buried, sometime after that, they dug up that place and they were going to bury another man there. 
And you know what happened when, they, when that man was buried in Elisha's place? He was raised to life. That was a miracle from God. There are many instances where people have been raised from death to life. Right? But the question is, what happens in that unknown? Because none of us have been there. All who have died, they, they have not testified to us what had happened there. But the Bible gives us a record of some people who have died. And we're going to focus on John chapter 11, Lazarus' account. So we see that Lazarus had passed away. And Lazarus was not clinically dead. So I've led the brethren that Lazarus tewesti kajua toboa. For four days, Lazarus was absolutely dead. To be clinically dead, sometimes there are people who have stayed um, without um, brain function for a while, or they have not been breathing on their own for a while, but they are not, clinic they are not actually dead, they are clinically dead. But Lazarus was totally dead. Lazarus stayed for four days in the tomb. And then the Bible tells us that Jesus raised Lazarus to life. But this is, the, this is the key point. All those people who were raised from death to life, none of them have said, this is what I saw. In the near-death experiences, all the people who experienced the near-death experience, a special phenomena that they experienced, they said they saw a light. They said they saw a loved one. Somebody reached out to them. But for Lazarus, he was silent. Moses was silent. That, that um, young man, the, the widow's son, five more minutes, Elder Dose. The widow's son was silent, all right? That goes to show us, brethren, that all the people who we actually believe by faith was raised from death to life, none of them said anything about this strange phenomenon. The Bible tells us in um, Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Savle dinu, brethren, exam bon listo apu no sa. Saka dinu, kono le la teala, nuka tavai. Pa ve pu le bos la la pu tavai, ek le bos la pa la pu patavai. Work as if you are working for the Lord. Is that clear? We must give an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. You are not working, but you are at home. Mommy said, sweep the house. Don't wait when you hear mommy's vehicle coming for you to start sweeping. Do it well and do it with all your might. Is that clear, brethren? Yeah. Praise the Lord. I think somebody said amen to that. Okay, so, um, um, yes. For there is no work. This is what the Bible is saying. La panita vai. There is no device. I don't know how you say device in Patwa. La pani pies no lage. La pani pies la chages. In the grave whither thou goest. In other words, when we die and we are buried, there is nothing. We are sleeping until the resurrection. Is that clear, brethren? Okay, let's move on. Um, now, since they asked me to wrap up, let me just say this, eh, brethren. Let's end with our local palace. Eswatan about Jagaji. Eswatan about Maginwe. I do, brethren. Sa tout se ba isa. Awe tout li son. Tout li son ka di nou. Dat la ni an no laj nom ka pa la bot. Sa an no laj akwadi i ete wanse. Like it's interesting. It's mystical. And sometimes we may be tempted to know. And that's why Eve was. Eve was offered something that was mystical. She didn't fully know, but she wanted to know. She was intrigued. There's a knowledge that young people are now interested in. You know, you're not making progress in life, but you hear, you know, somebody tap you on the shoulder and tell you, man, if you come with me, we will fix the business for you. You will get more customers than you ever dreamed of. When you go to the airport, all the hassle that those people are going through, you don't have to go through that. Life will be nice. Life will be easy. But remember, it is a deception. In the last days, brethren, 
And even now, there are many who are following the way of the occult in one way or another. Even sometimes within the walls of our church, there are those who have joined and formed alliances with the occult. And brethren, let me tell you, no matter what Satan offers, it is a lie. He will show that it is beautiful and that you need to go there and that you will get all the answers that you seek. But it is a lie. There is nothing but danger and distress when you follow the way of Satan. Now, brethren, our joy is in the Lord. There is a song that I want to end with. I just want to say the words of the song. The song says, under his wings, I am safely abiding. You see, while people are doing what they are doing over there, and you're at work, they're trying to destroy you, and they're trying to make your work, you know, not as wonderful as it's supposed to be, and at home you cannot sleep well, because there's something always in the rafter, or there's somebody troubling you, and you just find that as if life is against you, the message for this morning is not that the occult is, is a big thing, but that you have a God that is bigger than giants. The Bible tells us, brethren, that we have to abide underneath Christ. When we abide under his wings, brethren, he will cover and protect us. Now, let me tell you, there are times you will go through things in life and you will think that your only solution is to go to the garden. By God's grace, resist it in Jesus' name. Ask the Lord to help you. Comfort and strengthen, brethren. He is willing to aid, to aid you and he will carry you through. May God bless you. We've been sitting for a while. Shall we all stand and turn our hymnal to number 306? Draw me nearer. Yeah, run, yeah, run, bless. 
may now have your seats. For those of you just joining us, welcome to Sabbath School. Our encouragement was entitled, Facing Your Giants. And our scripture reading was Isaiah 41 verse 10. And it says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, hey, I will help thee. Hey, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Throughout this encouragement, we went, we went through the story of David and Goliath. The only thing we have to fear is God. In this story, we saw wars cannot be won without bravery. Jesus instructed his disciples not to fear, for those who kill the body cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And we can see this in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. How could Jesus expect them not to be afraid? Because he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, verse 5. The greatest, their greatest adversaries were no match for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Our, greatest, our adversaries are no match for our God. This truth gave them the courage to respond. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Hebrews chapter 13 verse 6. If you feel fear, shift your focus from the problem to the solution. In the midst of your struggle, Jesus is standing beside you. He will never abandon you and nothing is impossible for him. Mark chapter 20 verse 27. Thank you all for being present at Sabbath School. I am your superintendent, Sister Dahlia. We will now be favored with a special item of music by Sister Descat. a mountain that I never faced before. That's why I'm calling on you, Lord. I know it's been a while, but Lord, please hear my prayer. I need you like I never have before. Sometimes it takes a mountain Sometimes a troubled sea Sometimes it takes a desert To get a hold Trust you and believe. Forgive me, Jesus. I thought I could control whatever life would throw. brought me to my knees. I need you, Lord, and I'm not ashamed to say. Sometimes it takes a mountain. Sometimes a trouble Sometimes it takes a day. 
the house of the Lord. Are you facing your giants today? How does your giant compare with Goliath? Joshua chapter 1 verses 9 says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wheresoever you go. Many times in life, we will face giants that seems impossible to conquer. But God promises in his word that we already have the victory in Christ. Faith doesn't always seem to be the best option. But truth be told, it is the only option that will really bring true victory. We all know what it's like for a challenge that seems impossible to conquer. Many times in the Bible, we see that happens. David against Goliath, Gideon against the Midianites, Moses against Pharaoh. And in each of those situations, God conquered for those who put their faith in him. God brings giant storms and challenges us, not because he wants us to suffer for our sins, but so that we will grow in character, and in our faith in him. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verses 8 to 9 says, We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Hallelujah. So let us go. Let go and let God. Would you all stand as we pray? Hallelujah to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Oh, we exalt your name, Father God. We exalt your name. We praise you, Lord. We worship and we honor you, Father, because you are worthy. You are so worthy. We thank you so much this morning, Lord, that you have brought us here. You woke us up, Heavenly Father. Lord, so many did not see today. And so we are here today just to praise you, Father God, to worship you, Lord, and to honor you because we know 
that it is because of you, your grace and your mercies, Father, that we are standing here this morning, Lord. And for that, Father God, we just lift up our our voices, Father God, and we just praise and honor your mighty God. How worthy are you, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you so much for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for all the giants you have conquered, Almighty God. All the giants you have destroyed, Father. All the unseen battles that you have fought on our behalf, Almighty God. And we know, Father, that you have never lost a battle, O oh God. And Father, we know that if we put our trust in you, we will continue to conquer. We will continue, Father God, to lift up your name. We will continue to succeed, Father God, because we know who is on our side. We know whose we are. Father, we just humble this morning. We humble ourselves at the foot of the cross, Lord, and we place all those giants, Father God. We leave them there, Father. We have nothing to do with those giants anymore because we know that within our own selves, Father, we cannot defeat them. But because we have this mighty rock, Jesus Christ, on our side, we can now say, Lord, take control. Take over all those giants. Oh, Father God, destroy all those chains, Father. Set your children free. Set your people free, Father God. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that is in our midst this morning, Father. We thank you for the lives that you will be touching this morning, oh God. Father, we thank you for the sick that you are touching right now, those you are healing, almighty God, because we know that you are the mighty conqueror, the giant conqueror, Father. This morning, Father, as we lift up our voices, oh God, to you, we know that we are not going to live here the same way, but when we live, we are going to live blessed and different, Father, because we know that each and every one of us will be touched, oh God, by your favor, by your grace, and by your mercies, oh God, this morning. Father, we pray for the leaders of the church, almighty God. We pray that you continue to touch them in a special way, Father God, and that you'll continue to renew their minds so that they can lead your people, heavenly Father, the way, Lord, that you have commanded them to Heavenly Father, Lord, we also pray for our regular members. You know what is happening, oh God, in their lives. And so we pray that you continue to touch them and to fight for them, Heavenly Father. Lord, we pray, O oh God, for the visitors in our midst, Almighty God. We ask that you touch them in a very special way. Touch their hearts, Heavenly Father. And so when they leave here, Lord, let them leave, Father God, with the thought that I will come back, Heavenly Father, because they know that they had an encounter with you this morning. Father God, we just bless your mighty name, O oh God. We praise you, Father. We worship you, Almighty God. Oh, we lift up your mighty name on high, Father, there is none but just you. You alone, Father, you alone, Lord, can de deliver your children, Father God, from whatever the circumstances. And so as we continue to praise your mighty name, O oh God, we pray, Father, that you fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us anew. Fill us fresh, Almighty God. Oh, Father, we just thank you for your anointing this morning. And Father God, we just ask you this in the name of your precious Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that we are the body of Christ and he has called us to go out and minister unto those who are out there, not just to stay in here but to minister unto those out there because we are the body of Christ.
she slips in Trying to fade into the faces The girl's teasing laughter is Carrying farther than they know Farther than they know If we are the body In the scriptures, Jesus says in Matthew 7, 24, Anyone who listens to my teaching and obeys me is wise. Like a person who builds his house on solid rock, though the rain comes in torrent and the flood waters rise and the wind beat against his house, it won't collapse because it is built on solid rock. But anyone who hears my teachings and ignores it is like a foolish person who builds his house on sand. And when the rains and floods waters come and the wind beat against that house, it falls with a mighty crash. Now, what the scripture is trying to tell us is the teachings of Jesus allows us to face and fight the giants in our lives. And unless we make Jesus part of that teaching and part of our lives, those giants will definitely overthrow us. But anyone who listens to the voice of Jesus 
and follow this teaching is going to be like the man who builds his house on solid rock. Today, we are here not just to fight those battles, not just to fight those giants, not just to overcome them, but to give praise, honor, and glory to the person or the being who can help us overcome those giants. Amen? Amen. All right. And so I'm going to ask you to stand with me for just a little while as we give praise to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we are going to have a prayer, and then we're going to sit back down. Praise team, come. Five hundred and twenty nine under his wings, I am safely abiding. One seven. victory even those that overcome the world. Let us pray. Our mighty God and Father, in you we live and move and have our beings. And we do thank you because of your son Jesus Christ who has overcome on the cross of Calvary. And you have told us if we follow you in return we will overcome. Thank you for what you have done and what you are continuing to do in our lives. Father, we know without you we are nothing, but with you all things are possible. So we give you thanks, we give you honor, we give you praise, we give you great glory through your Son, because in him we have life and we have it more abundantly. So today we pray that you would give us that unction of the Holy Spirit, that we may function and that we may magnify your name, because we have made up our minds that we will not give up and that we will walk with you every step of the way. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer, and help us to stand with you both now and forevermore, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen and amen. So I am sure the time will come. Yes, have your seats, please. I am sure the time will come when we are going to sing, I've got my mind made up, and I won't turn back, no matter what happened, because Jesus is the ultimate person who is going to give us the victory as we overcome the world. God bless.
major works have been done here at the Community Services Center and we are getting ready to do our finishing works. However, in order to accomplish this, we are soliciting your assistance. I am excited, I'm elated that the CS Center is on its way to completion. But we need you, we need you, we need every one of you to ensure that this center can be completed before the end of the year and many who are in need can get help. For persons wishing to contribute towards this project, we ask that you contact Pastor Lucius Philip, who is our Community Services Director at 720-6841, or you can contact me, Mariah Simon Joseph, the President of the Federation, at 719-1335. For our online viewers, we invite you to please visit our St. Lucia Mission website at stlucaadventist.org. Click on the online giving button and follow the directions after. Please indicate that your contribution will be towards the Community Services Center, which is ongoing. Thank you. Pathfinders, join us for the 5th Inter-American Division Pathfinder Camporee. Thousands of Pathfinders from across our division and around the world will be there for a spectacular event like no other. Come and feel the pulse, the vibe, and the rhythm of Jamaica. On April 48, 2023, Pathfinders in Mission Camporee will impact this Caribbean Jew for Jesus. Experience the live drama every evening about Gideon on the Lord's mission. There will be grand baptisms and testimonies of lives transformed through Christ and pathfindering. It will be exciting, adventurous, inspirational, informative. Join pathfinders from more than 50 countries and islands for this grand camboree. There will be parades, drilling and marching competitions, and tons of other field events just for you. Come and achieve additional honors, trade pins, and be invested in another Pathfinder class. Remember, the Inter-American Division camboree happens once every five years, so you can't afford to miss this one. It's the 5th Inter-American Division Pathfinder Camporee, Pathfinders in Mission, Jamaica, April 4 to 8, 2023. Come and be inspired for mission. We will be continuing on our singing from our own hymnal, starting with hymn number 618, Sitting at the Feet of Jesus. Sitting at the feet of Jesus.
of the pure and the holy.
more than a responsibility. I consider it an appointment with our heavenly host. And it is to help make feel welcome each and every single one of us, either traveling or has traveled this beautiful king's highway on our way to his bright and blissful everlasting place called heaven. To us, our heavenly father says, on this extraterrestrial experience, ensure that we come with no earthly baggage, but with our hearts. He says, don't bother to try cleaning or polishing our hearts before getting there. Jesus, the master producer of hearts cleaning agents, the master blaster of sins of any gravity is awaiting to receive, cleanse, and purify us with his spilled blood. He says, he is aware that some of us are weary, but deeply searching for him for deliverance. Come fast, he says. Look west, look west, no, no east, lest we be distracted. Just come, come as we are. To those who always come because of routine or custom, he says, words cannot describe the joy his kingdom feels by you choosing to be on that journey this morning. To those who take a joy ride or who choose to take a joy ride, you may be visitors. In his kingdom, there are no visitors. He's, he is father to all, friend to all, savior of all. He is the creator. He is the owner of the thousand cattle, or the, the cattle on the thousand hills. So there is room and enough to serve everyone. To all our St. Lucian brethren and friends, you should have realized that you are definitely part of this divine celebration today. So, welcome. To those afar and abroad, Adventist or not, by now you should have heard and experienced the vibrations of these peals of thundering heavenly welcome, coupled by lightning, which glorifies the heavenly atmosphere. This is the glorious presence of our heavenly King and Father from the heavenly realms, reaching out to you wherever you are. To our Father, our Father says, you will never be forgotten. You are a planned part of this heavenly convocation. And you will always be as long as it is your desire. So, welcome. Friends, this is the might of the Father we serve. He knows and can do all things. He loves and loves all beyond measure, beyond compare. Welcome, he says to us. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. And because he is so welcoming, let us to open our hearts to him and welcome him in a most or the most extraordinary way. So let's pray, pay homage to him, honoring him in standing with our call to worship. So let us stand. Our call to worship. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever 
Amen. Romans 11, 36 to 33 to 36. Thank you. Crisis, we can still worship God with our limited resources. In the time of the Apostle Paul, the members of the churches of Macedonia were facing a severe financial trial. He said that, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Alongside others, they could partake in the joy of sharing and participating in God's mission, not restricted by their rock-bottom poverty. It was God's gift to them. Many are still experiencing the joy of being generous during times of scarcity today. A pastor of a local church appealed to his church members to bring a special offering for the Christmas Eve service. The donation received would go to an impoverished family of the church. The appeal moved one low-income family, who decided to make some sacrifices to participate in this offering. They ate simpler food and even skipped Christmas gifts for themselves. On Christmas Eve, they counted their savings, brought it to church, and dropped them into the offering bag. They joyfully returned home, excited that they could be part of this initiative. Later that night, the doorbell rang, and the church pastor handed them an envelope containing just a little more than the family had brought to church earlier. Whatever our financial situation, we can still experience the joy of giving. This is possible because God has not set a minimum acceptable amount. All can give as much as they were able. This text is an indication that God, in His divine provision, invites His children to give in proportion to the income received. Therefore, when we establish a percentage of our income to be regularly given as offering, if we receive more from God, more we give back to Him. If we receive less, less will be given. And if we receive nothing, also nothing will be returned to God. This week, as we worship God with our tithes and promise, let's taste the joy of proportional giving, God's project for a consistent way to give. May we put our desires last and God first. Now we'll call on our deacons as they collect the tithe offering and gift. We'll call on Sister Millie as she come up and bless our hearts. Happy Sabbath, brethren. Exodus 14, verse 14 says, The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Breaking through the 
dark of night will not overtake me. I am pressing into you. Can we please stand for the reading of God's word? Our scripture reading will be from Romans chapter 13, verses 11 to 13. That is Romans chapter 13, verses 11 to 13. And the word of the Lord says, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Let us pray. Dear Father, we just thank you so much for bringing us into your presence. Thank you that you have allowed us to have the health and the ability to move, and thank you that you have given us so many blessings. We realize, Lord, that we are not where we're supposed to be, but we thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercies that we are able to still come to, your, to you and pray, that you still hear us. Thank you that you're willing to change us and make us new. I don't know who has come here today, some with heavy hearts, some with hearts of praise, but we all want healing from you. So please heal us, Lord. Make us new. Help us to hear a word from you. Even as we have given this offering and our tithes, we just pray that a blessing upon it. Let it multiply as Jesus multiplied the fishes and loaves. Please let it do marvelous works in others' lives and that we will see also the blessing in our life. As we go through this service, be with us. Let your Holy Spirit truly be here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, we will hear a word from the Lord 
from our own very own pastor, Pastor Leons. But before we hear him, we will have Sister Marie Dubois to minister to us for a special item. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Sister Marie, for singing for us this morning. We came here to bless the Lord's name and for him to bless us. Amen? So we are truly grateful, Marie, that you came this morning to bless us with this special song. And we are truly grateful to God for bringing us here. Amen? How many of you slept by the market last night on a cardboard? Raise your hand. Let me see. Nobody. All right. How many of you spent a few nights 
not sleeping at the hospital. Raise your hand for me to see. All right, okay. Well, uh, just a few raised their hands for having spent time at the hospital. But this morning, what I'm trying to aim at is, let us be grateful to God for his blessings upon us. God has been good to us. God has been merciful to us. God has been long-suffering towards us. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Our theme for this morning, our theme for this morning, now is the time. Now is the time. And I would say to us this morning that there is no better time than now. As we go into the message this morning, I trust that by God's grace, we live here convinced that there's no better time now to serve the Lord. There's no better <laughs> time than now. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon said, there is a time for everything. And in Romans chapter 13, in Romans chapter 13, Paul declared that now is the time to awake out of spiritual sleep. I think that the devil gave us something to drink or something to eat. And he has put many in a spiritual sleep. My objective this morning is to help us by God's grace to understand the times in which we live and to live here committed by the grace of God to serve God as we should and to commit our lives more meaningful, completely, in other words, completely to him because the times in which we live are a very difficult time. I want, before I go further, I want to invite the, the praise team to come forward and sing for us number 373, Seeking the Lost. Before there is thing, I would like us to stand as we have a word of prayer this morning. Before I go to the word of God. The praise team is getting ready. Now him, they will be singing with us and leading us is number 373, Seeking the Lost. I invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Eternal Heavenly Father, you who have brought me here to bring this message today, I depend on you and I ask that you take over completely. You put me aside and you speak through me and you bring out the message that you have given me to share today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Seeking the lost 
Thank you very much, praise team. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. The God we serve, the God of heaven and earth, our creator, our sustainer, our provider, our redeemer, is a God of time. Amen? Amen. A God of time. That's why we are here today worshiping him on the Sabbath day because God has set aside this day in the cycle of time as a special day, a day sanctified for holy use, for worshiping him. That's why we are here. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I thank God for this privilege. I thank God for this blessing that we can be here today to worship the Lord. The time is coming. What did I say? Did I say tomorrow, Ali? No, I didn't say tomorrow. I said the time is coming. Okay, good. Because I don't know when it will be exactly. But based on what we are seeing, we believe it may not be too long before we cannot assemble in, in, in fashion like we are today in the church like this, worshiping God. So we really have to appreciate the time that we have. And we really have to thank God. And there's another side to it as well. Once we go down in that casket, in that tomb, that's it. In Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6, the Bible says the dead know not anything. They cannot come back again to say anything. And God is the one who controls the universe. He decides what will happen on earth, at what time, at what place, how everything will happen. God decides everything. And he's so good and so loving and kind. He has given us the Bible, a map, a chart, a compass to guide us so we can know the major events he plans that will take place upon planet Earth. That's why he gave us the books of Daniel and Revelation. And these are books we need to go back into. And don't hurt your head about you don't understand every minute detail. Don't worry that. Once we know that Jesus died to save us, once we know that he's coming soon and we ought to be ready, and we are determined by the grace of God to be ready, and we, come, we put our lives completely in God's hand, whether we understand all of Daniel and Revelation or not, once our relationship with God is right, we will be saved. But it's good to study. It's good to study. And Jesus also made some predictions about things that would happen when this world is nearing the end of its existence. And I want you to follow closely this morning. You know, I'll, I'll, I'm making you a promise. I'll try not to be long. But here's what will happen. I will stop when I'm finished. In the book of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 12, here's what Jesus says. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Hallelujah. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I... I go there sometimes. And the Greek word that is used for iniquity in Matthew 24, 12 is a word that is nikwate, meaning lawlessness. And I'm telling you, if you're alive and you live in this world, you will know that lawlessness is rampant all over the place. People just don't care about law. They just don't obey law. Even in little St. Lucia, even on the roads, now, before I, I get into my vehicle, when I start, before I start, I say, I sing the song, Nearer My God Today. Because they pass you anywhere, they overtake you anywhere. The new rule is nobody must drive behind you. So even if they kill 10, they don't care. But God is telling us that although there is lawlessness in the land, not just in St. Lucia, throughout the world, I'm sure you will agree with me that God is still in control regardless to the lawlessness that we see around. God is still in control. And presently, throughout the world, we are witnessing a level of wickedness and violence that has never been seen before. St. Lucia is not excluded. I say St. Lucia is not excluded. We are experiencing what people will describe as an un unprecedented situation. Some things that are happening we never saw before in St. Lucia. The ground is saturated with blood. 
the blood of our young men, the majority young men in their prime life are, are running on the ground like water. The earth is crying, and I hear the voice of God asking, where are your brothers? And someone answers, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? I would say to us this morning, yes, I am my brother's keeper. You are our, brother, our keeper of our brothers. And someone is brushing aside like a joke. I've met people like that, and I don't believe we have them in Balata Church, but I've met people like that who say, well, I don't care. Just the boys in the gangs killing one another. Well, I say that's not the approach we should take. We should be concerned. We should be praying. We should be fasting. We should be lifting up the nation before the Lord. We should be praying for the boys. And we should be praying that God bring an end to the violence. Amen. What do you say? Brothers and sisters, I don't know if you can enjoy a good night's sleep, if you can enjoy a good meal, when you hear the cry of mothers who have lost sons, when you hear the, 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 the children who have lost fathers, when you hear the fathers who have lost sons, when you hear people mourn and groan and say what this effect this is having on them, the son just went down the road and got shot down. I know for me, it makes me sad. I know in my part, I wish I could do something about it. But what I can do is to pray and ask God to intervene. And there's something else that we can do. We'll come to that in a while. In 2 Kings, and I want you to follow me well. In 2 Kings chapter 6 and chapter 7, chapter 6 to chapter 7, verses 3 to 10, the story is told of a time in the history of Israel when they were under siege by the Syrian army and they were not able to go into their city or come out of their city. And it came a time when they were short of food to the point that mothers were eating their children. That's a time, a sad time. Sad time. Because it takes a lot for a mother to punish a child, a genuine mother much less to eat your child. And in chapter 17, we read from verse 3, and I want to read it in your hearing. And there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate, and they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? If we say, we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore, come, and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, but we shall die. Verse 5. And they arose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no one found there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots. Praise the Lord. Mighty God. And the noise of horses. Even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel have hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore, they arose and fled in the twilight and they left their tents and their horses, and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. Verse 8. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink, and carried then silver and gold and raiment, and went and hid it, and came again, and entered into another tent, and carried thence also, and went and hid it. Verse 9, and they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. 
So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied, and the tents as they were. Verse 9 is our focus in this context this morning. Notice that the men, they put on royal robes for the first time on them. They, they ate food that they never ate before. They were starving, and now they had abundance of food, abundance of, of drink, and everything. And they decided to settle down and have a good feast and have a good time. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. And the Spirit of the Lord told them, listen, look at you. Look at food you have. Look at clothes you have. Look at all the blessings you have. And how about the people in the city? So they went and told the people in the city. I'm using this this morning to apply to us as God's people in 2022. Here we are today, enjoying life. We just sang. We sang. We prayed. We prayed. We are enjoying ourselves. We feel peace, tranquility. We are saved. We are bound for the land of the pure and holy. And we say hallelujah, praise the Lord. But how about the boys on the block? How about the people prostituting? How about those who need to know Jesus and make a commitment to him and find that peace, overcome the depression, the anxiety, the suicidal thoughts to be able to live life and enjoy life. But here we are enjoying life at Nupamele APO. Zafe yo. Say yo ki pote sa asuko yo. I've been doing a couple funerals for some of the boys who got shot. And somebody, at one of, of, when I was preparing one of them and I said I'm going to this funeral and so on, the person told me, si, si te mwen, mwen pa mwen pe le te mwen ba yo. An Adventist, you know. But you notice I didn't call names. Okay, good. Let's leave it there. But here we are. Enjoying life. Preparing for eternal life. Eternal life. And most of us, if not all of us, when we pass, if we pass before Jesus comes, we will die with the blessed hope. But how about the people? The others, our neighbors, our friends, our relatives who do not know the Lord. Are we going to say like this, lepers, let's sit down and eat and enjoy ourselves and leave them? Or are we going to say, by the grace of God, let us go and share? So they, had, they felt a responsibility to go and share. I'm saying to us today, it is well and done to come to church, enjoy ourselves, and so on, but we must go and share. We must go and help the hopeless. We must go and help people. These men, I thank God that this recorded that they went and they did a good job in the city. I would say to us this morning, it is time to be involved in meaningful outreach activities. Sister White made an important statement that I want to highlight this morning. In the book, Ministry of Healing, page 143, here's what she said. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. A sequence. Introduce himself to them. Work with them. Help them. And you know, sometimes we judge people. Sometimes we say, well, they're in the ghetto. They're this. They're that. If we go there, they will hold us and strangle us. If we go there, they will... Well, of course... If you go there and say the wrong thing, you might not come back out alive. <laughs> because I've been to so many ghettos here in St. Lucia, work with them. So now I know what I'm telling you. But if you go under the anointing of God and you say the right things and do the right things, you'll be amazed to see how they will welcome you, they will embrace you, they will work with you, and God will give you opportunities to help them. I remember going to a particular one. And then God showed me a method that when you go in, you first look for the leader. And you go through the leader, Ali. You don't just walk into these places. You might not come back alive. 
So I asked for the leader, spoke with him, told him who I am, told him what we intend to do as a church. I represent the church. I'm a pastor and so on and so on. And I asked the question, what do you think that we as a church can do for your community? And here's what he told me. He told me, boss man, we don't want our children to raise up like us. We don't want them to become like us. We want you to work with our children so that they are saved from this kind of lifestyle and they're transformed. Well, as it worked out that I left the area prematurely, I was transferred out and I was not able to continue the work. But I'm saying that sometimes we prejudge, but if we go and work with them under the anointing of God, we'll be amazed to see what can happen. So my message this morning is, that's why Jesus, if you notice Jesus' ministry, Jesus' ministry, he, he, he was involved in a lot of healing, a lot of feeding, a lot of comforting of depressed people, hopeless people, giving, um, grieving people. Jesus was always there with people who needed him. One thing I can say for Balata Church I thank God that you are a caring church. And you must keep it that way. I thank God that you are a loving church. We have been having a lot of um, stretching our hands out to a lot of people in the community, having funerals for them, whether they're Adventists or not, whether they never come back, come to church or not. We extend and we are grateful to God for the privilege of serving as Jesus did. But I know some sad places, unfortunately, if the church burns down, I'm talking about Adventist church now. If that church burns down, people will be happy. They will say, Te jale. Hmm. In the book of Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 17, I'm just beginning to preach, by the way. In the book of Luke chapter 4, verse 16 to 18, here's what Jesus says. Talking about ministry, how we should be involved in ministry, what kind of ministry we should be engaging, especially now in 2022. Here's what Jesus says. And he, the Bible says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it, is, where it was written. He's saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. And recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. When you go back home. I would like you to go through the text, Luke 4, verse 18, and look at some keywords. He said, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed him. You don't just do the work of God if you are not anointed. To preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Are there people around us who are brokenhearted? To preach deliverance to the captives. Are there people who are captives by drugs or whatever kind of vice, whatever type of method Satan is using to keep them captive? Do you see them in your neighborhood? Do you see them at work? Do you see them around the streets where you walk? I see a lot. And recovering of sight to the blind. There are some people who are so spiritually blind, they cannot see anything about God. And to set at liberty them that are bruised. The devil has bruised even some in our churches. The devil will bruise anyone he can bruise to make us lose our salvation. So while the emphasis is on working outside, we should also work inside as well. Amen? We have some of our brethren who are bruised. And sometimes instead of healing them, we bruise them even more. You know, there's an African proverb that says, if a man is already down in the gutter, you don't kick him. <laughs> I like it. I like it. In Luke chapter 7, Verses 11 to 17, Jesus was entering the city, and he sees a funeral procession, procession going, and he stopped them. 
It was the son of a widow. Malabes la teja ped mad mawi. Sel gason ini a poison ika pedli. Jesus being God knew that. So he stopped the procession. And he raised the boy back to life, resurrected him, and gave him back to his mother. There are some people who need to be resurrected around us. Some people who have died psychologically, they have, died, they have not died physically yet, but some, people, some of them are just walking dead. And you know, the sad thing is, maybe not just only in the community, you know, maybe even among us as God's people. So we have to do what Jesus did. More healing than teaching. More meeting the needs than preaching. More taking care of hurting people than preaching. I'm not saying preaching is wrong. We should preach. And Paul says that if we don't preach, who will preach? So we must preach. But when we go, we must tell them there's a solution in Jesus. We must tell them that governments are the, to play a role in trying to reduce crime and gun-related violence, but it is God who can truly bring an end to the crime and killings because they are here because of sin. And only God, only God has the solution to bring the sin problem to an end. And you must not go with an air of arrogance, with humility, but you must go with conviction. You must go with persuasion and let them know that. Tell them that God is not happy over the level of crime and violence in our world, and particularly in St. Lucia. And remind them that in Genesis 6, verses 5 and 7, and you should read it for them, and I want to read it for you. Heard what it says. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. <coughs> and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. The context to this is, just before God sent the flood to destroy the antediluvian world, God said, listen, enough is enough. There's enough wickedness. There's enough violence. If I leave you there, you will just do more wickedness and more violence. So he sent the flood. I'm saying this to tell us that we must remind people who don't read the Bible, people who don't know the Bible, maybe people who don't believe the Bible, or even if they say they believe, remind them that God is still the same. When the antediluvians had reached their level, God said, enough is enough. So remind them in St. Lucia that when the crime level reached its level, God will say, enough is enough. It is already bad. I hope it stops. I hope it does not continue to grow. But God is still a God of time. And in God's own time, God will handle it. But we must do our part, amen? We must collaborate with God. We must talk. We must preach. We must pray. And we must do our part. When we go, we must tell them that God wants to break Satan's stronghold on mankind and wants to heal the earth from wickedness and violence. But he has outlined some conditions that must be met before he can do that. I will not have time to go into them, many this morning, but I should go into one, at least one. And it is found in the book of Chronicles. Second Chronicles, chapter 7 and verse 14. Here's what he says. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Praise the Lord. In all my life as a pastor, I've never conducted so many funerals in one year than I've done this year. And you're looking at 40 years. But 
Of late, God has told me, whenever there's a funeral, remind the people of this. And appeal to the people. Appeal to the people to turn to God. For God, he said, if we repent and if we seek his face and if we confess and forsake sin, he will hear us. God is calling us, Seventh-day Adventists, to do and lead out in that work. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God is calling us to lead out in that work. And we must take it seriously. Take it seriously and undertake that work. We must tell them that Jesus is coming soon. And quote for them Matthew 24, the sum of the signs and the other places in the Bible with signs of Jesus soon coming. Tell them that in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, God declared, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And let them know that we have to prepare for the judgment. Let them know that the judgment is for everybody. And at the judgment, there is no, I'm a lawyer, I'm a president, I'm a prime minister, I'm this, I'm that. At the judgment, everybody stands to God, before God, as equal. You know, if men and women were thinking of standing before God for judgment, I believe many would not do some of the things they're doing. I believe some of them would put down the guns. I believe that some of them would stop the stealing. I believe that many would stop what they're doing. And not just them, but us. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. For there's not one rule of salvation for them and another one for us. We must not fool ourselves. It's not them and us. It is all of us. One God. One rule of salvation. When we go, we must also tell them that it is time to put down the guns, the knives, the cutlasses, the weapons of destruction. In Matthew 26, 52, Jesus said to Peter, put away your sword. You cut the man here, you should not have done that, but put away your sword. And then Jesus said, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Those who live by the sword. Tell them to live vengeance to God. Let God forgive them. Let God work with it. Pray for your enemy, Jesus said. And remind them of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, where Jesus said, if we do not forgive others, he will not also forgive us. Tell them, tell parents, tell parents to teach their children good values. Whenever I do baby dedications, I don't just say, come, let us have a prayer. I also, by the grace of God, try to challenge parents to teach their children good values. I try to emphasize that you're doing nation building. Don't just look at your job of what you do. Oh, I'm just at home. I'm just taking care of the children. No, you are playing a very significant part. You are building nation. You are building future. And you know, I want to make a very strong appeal this morning. It is maybe mostly for those on side, but it may apply to some inside. I don't know. I'm just doing what God tells me to do. I'm just saying what God asked me to say. Here's what God asked me to say. Sometimes, some parents know what some of their children are doing, and they're just hiding them. And when they die, when they got shot, oh, you know, Tom was the best boy in the neighborhood. But by that time, Tom had bought, Tom is working as a gardener somewhere, but he had already bought a Jeep, he had already bought a bike, he had already started to build a house, he had already this, he had already that, he had already, and so on. And you pass up? You just have bien. Si pani si tu es pani vole. So I'm sending a message to us as God's people today that we should take the lead. If our children are doing wrong, don't condone them, pray with them, appeal to them, but don't condone and hide and shield them. As you go out, tell the adults to be positive role models for the children. Tell those who are guilty not to engage young children in illegal actions. Sometimes they use the children because they say if they catch the children, they'll not send them to jail and things of that sort. We as Adventists, as Christians, should not participate in that kind of behavior. I'm going to start to appeal to us as God's people now. Before we go and tell people to be cleansed of sin, we have to be anointed, not just appointed. I want to repeat that. I said... And I'm repeating, 
I said earlier we should go and tell them. We should go and work with them. That's all right. That's what Jesus did. But before Jesus did that, he spent whole nights of prayer. He went to the, to the Mount of Olives. I'm saying to us today, as Seventh-day Adventists, listen to me well. Look in the camera. Look at my face. Look at me well. I'm saying to us as Seventh-day Adventists, before we go and tell, we have to be anointed and not just appointed. We are going to, we are going to into turbulent times and it's going to get worse for us. Because in Daniel 12 and 1 and Revelation 9 and verse 15, tell us that there will be a time of trouble such as we had never seen before. So it's likely to get worse. But I'm saying that before we go and tell, we must get the anointing. Get the anointing. So I want to appeal to us. Brethren, it is time to take a look at us. It's time to take a look at us. We are failing. We are falling in many areas. We are losing power. We are losing influence. And the eyes of the world are upon us. I was in a certain place. In a certain place. And the Bebron was saying to me, Pastor, we are not what we used to be. Long time when you say you're Adventist, you had influence, you had power. But today, they're taking us with the chill. You can't papi show, no. Are you still there? Okay, good, all right. You're still there. All right. We are, we are baptizing. Listen to me well. We are baptizing, but not growing. We are making a lot of noise, but not a lot of relevance. We do a lot of training, but not a lot of equipping. We are becoming like politicians trying to impress people for the next election. Hallelujah. Hmm. We are replacing God's demands and expectations of us with man-made policies. We are baptized. Now, get me well. I'm not against baptism. This is one of the services I like most in the church, baptism. I like to baptize. Baptism is good, but when we baptize, but not growing, when we are baptizing people today and they live tomorrow, we must admit that something is wrong. Training is good. I agree with training. But when training is all we have and no anointing, we will not win the battle for Christ. God does not call or choose or appoint the qualified. But he qualifies, trains, and anoints the called and chosen. I want to repeat that. I said, God does not call or choose or appoint the qualified, but he qualifies, trains, and anoints the called and chosen. And that's why Jesus declared to the church when he was about to begin his ministry in Luke 4, 16 to 18, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me. He didn't use the word appointed me. He has anointed me. That's, the difference is like day and night. Darkness and light. He has anointed me to preach the gospel. Anointed me. Anybody can appoint but only God can anoint. Wow. What a thing. What a solemn hour. You can sit in a committee and raise your hand and appoint somebody. But only God can anoint. Only God can anoint. So today, today, we need God's anointing. And that's one of the big problems confronting God's church today. Too many are appointed, but not anointed. They have friends who can raise their hands at committee meetings and appoint them, but they run without God's anointing. We can jump up and down and make a lot of noise in the pulpit, but when we do not follow Christ's method of evangelism, we will never have true success. I'm not criticizing anybody's style. Those who want to jump can jump. Those who want to run can run. That's your style. That's all right. But I'm telling you today, there's nothing wrong with that. But what is wrong is when you just make a lot of noise without the anointing. 
Remember what the servant of the Lord said. Christ's method alone will bring true success. Christ's method alone. You know, talking about Jesus and his ministry. When they were hungry, Jesus fed them. When they were naked, Jesus clothed them. When their hearts were broken, Jesus went to their homes and comforted them. He went to the prison and he visited them. When they were, when they were contemplating suicide, Jesus gave them hope. Because Jesus knows, Jesus knows that the root cause of suicide is the feeling of hopelessness. Jesus knows that it is when people are overwhelmed by hopelessness that they commit suicide. So his main thing was to bring hope to people. Our main job is to bring hope to people. Nobody commits suicide because they got a plane ticket to go to Dubai to look around and they give them a few thousand dollars in their pocket as spending money. Nobody will be so happy when they go and commit suicide. That doesn't happen. No. Nobody's going to commit suicide because they have been looking to get married and then finally, next week at this time, they'll be married and they know that God has blessed them with a wonderful wife, a wonderful husband, so therefore they commit suicide. No. They may commit suicide because they have been looking for this girl so long and all of a sudden this girl just goes to somebody else and then when they think that they're secured and they're getting married and setting date and inviting family and everybody, the girl goes to somebody else. So they might not be able to take the pressure and commit suicide. I'm saying to us this morning that Jesus knows and he can identify the feelings of our infirmities. He knows the causes of suicide. And we as a people ought to be sensitive as well. When they lost loved ones through death, Jesus comforted them. Today in St. Lucia, people are dying like flies. These days, criminals have, a place, uh, have placed um, the same value on human life as on rats and frogs. We need to go and comfort those who are grieving. They're grieving in your neighborhood. Go and comfort them. When they were taking the sword to fight, Jesus said, uh -uh, put it down. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And those who die, live by the gun will die by the gun. And we see it happening all throughout. I want to begin to wrap up. So I want to begin to make an appeal to us as God's people. The time has come, and there's no better time than now when we need to close our churches, some Sabbaths, not every Sabbath, but at least once a quarter, and go out to the communities around us and bring hope to the depressed people who may be contemplating suicide. Nobody's going to go to hell because you, you closed the church one Sabbath and you went in the community and prayed with people. You went and give them something. You went and helped them get their medication. You went and, and helped them get, cry with them and, and, and work with them. Nobody's going to go to hell for that. No. The time has come when we should put a greater emphasis on the health message that God has given us and appeal to both Adventists and non-Adventists to practice it. And by the way, I have been asked a couple of times by non-Adventists, you people have such a great message on health, can help the nation, why don't you do more to help the nation? I won't wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you who, but important people have asked me that before. Why don't we do more? Why don't we teach people more, go out more? And, and I think that some Sabbaths we should leave the pulpit and go out there and help those people. The time has come. And there's no better time than now. No better time than now when we should bring the food and the clothes to the hungry and minister to them how Jesus did. Whether they come to our church or not, whether they will ever get baptized and join the church or not. When you go back home, take your Bible, open it, read Jesus feeding 5,000. Did he say, these will come to church next Sabbath, I'll feed them. These might be baptized in two weeks' time, I'll feed them. No, Jesus said that the 5,000 needed feeding, he fed them. And let them decide if they will come to church or not. Let them decide if they will accept it or not. But Jesus appealed to them. He preached, yes. He preached and he appealed to them to accept as Lord. But he also took care of their needs. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Also took care of their needs. 
In Matthew 25, verses 44 to 46, Jesus said something that I want to share with you. In verse 44, Jesus said, Then they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, or, or thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did not do it to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. Verse 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. People believe that Jesus, some people who believe that we are saved by works, try to use this to say that Jesus is saying, if you don't do these works, you will go to hell and so on. But I, I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. I believe that Jesus is saying that is also important and he's concerned about that and he wants us to also do that. Because the, the scripture is very clear about we're not saved by works. We are not saved by works. Otherwise, Jesus would not have had to come on the cross and die. Amen? <clears throat> and in fact, the Bible explains it. And one of the scriptures that is very clear on that is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Hear what he says. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So when you go to heaven, wake up now. When you go to heaven, hey, Jesus, tell me, why did you write that part there? I don't understand it. Because I'll tell you, I don't fully understand why Jesus said that. I don't fully understand. Because we're not saved by works. When you go to the people, tell them that the world is coming to an end and we need to be ready for the soon coming of Jesus. Quote for them Revelation 14, verses 6 to 7, that God wants us as a people, as Seventh-day Adventists, God has given us a special responsibility to call people back to worship him, call people to observe the all the commandments, including the fourth commandment, which is the Sabbath day. God has given us a task. God has given us an assignment. God has given us a mandate, and he expects us to fulfill it. God is calling us to pray more than ever before as a nation, and pray for the nation. Pray and fast more. In Numbers 25, and that's my key appeal this morning. Holy Spirit, help me. This one, is, this one is big. Salah, go. In Numbers chapter 25, we read that when the devil saw that no matter what he did, he could not get the children of Israel. You know me by now. When I come here, it is something very serious. In Numbers chapter 25, the children of Israel, when the devil saw he could not win them, he could not take them, you know what he did? He made the Moabites women. And the Bible described them as fair and beautiful. Oh boy, what a description. <laughs> and James... The Bible says that when the men of Israel saw them, they said, I must have one. Another one said, I must have two. Another one said, I must have a couple. And they brought them into the tent. Now God had warned them. And God had said to them, listen, you must not touch them. You must not even give them the lingering look. You know, some men don't understand this. Let me divert a little bit to share this with you men. Sometimes it is not just the look. You see somebody, you just look. But what placed Samson and David in trouble is the lingering look. Your eyes are fixed. Your imagination starts to work. And you know the rest, history. So come back to Numbers 25. So they went and they brought the women into their tents. And the Bible tells us that God sent a plague among them and this burnt and killed a lot of them. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this 
Because I see a parallel, I see some similarities in what God is doing with us today as Seventh-day Adventists. Here's what I see. God, I see the devil has brought in the dark forces among us. I see the devil has brought in Lodge and Freemason and all kind of Masons into the church. And I'm not just imagining things. I'm telling you that I was in a certain place in a certain church. And we were talking about going out and working with the people. And a certain sister stood up as though the Holy Ghost fell upon her. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and the sister said, listen, let me tell you all something. Before we can go out there and preach, we need to clean up ourselves. She said, I try to minister and serve witness to my family. And some of them tell me, before you come and preach to us, go and talk to so and so. Go and tell them, why you have in your pulpit some people who are in lodge? Why you have them preaching? Why you have them on your pulpit? And they call the names. And they tell her who? They know who? And they say, before you come and preach to us, why you have these people on your pulpit when they're in lodge? I don't know what will happen to me tomorrow, but I'm under God's protection. <laughs> the Lord of hosts is with me. I know my wife is a bit concerned sometimes, but I have to say it. Then I was in another place. And this time an elder, an elder in the church, said, when they go out and witness, people are telling them, before you come to us, go and tell so-and-so. Before you tell us, tell so-and-so, and they call in names. Because they know some. Listen to me, people. You may hate the messenger, but accept the message. I believe that the time is now. I believe the time has come when we ought to clean up our acts. I believe that some are a hindrance to preventing the work of the Lord from going on as it should on the island of St. Lucia. Well, at least I said it before I die. At least I said it before I die. So in closing, in closing, in closing, I want to close with a story. You know, I, I like stories. Because once there's a, a story attached to the message, our minds tend to remember it more. All right, so here's the story. I'm coming down again. In the olden days in America, especially down Texas, California, there was what they called the Wild West. Out of control, no laws, and people just doing what they wanted and so on. But they had a policy, James, they had a law, that if a preacher is passing in a certain, anywhere, and he wants lodging and he goes to an inn, a motel, or a hotel, they were supposed to take him and don't make him pay. That was their rule. So one day, a minister traveling went to a hotel. And when he was leaving, they gave him a bill. So I said, but wait, the law has not changed. Why are you charging me? Why are you giving me this bill, the law? Why are you giving me this bill? The attendant turned to him and said, listen, from the time you came, we have been observing you. You have not prayed for anybody. You have not read any scripture for anybody. You have not ministered like anybody. You live like the rest of sinners. You will pay like the rest of sinners. And I'm looking in the camera this morning. Here's what God has asked me to say to us. Seventh-day Adventists, if we don't clean up our acts, if we don't repent for sex sin, I'm telling you this morning that we will live, we live, if we live like the rest of sinners, we'll go to hell like the rest of sinners.
I believe I've said what the Lord wanted me to say. I believe we can close. I believe by the grace of God, if we go to the Lord, if we pray, now is the time when we should be praying and fasting more than ever before. Now is the time when, as God's people, we should be applying the method of Jesus Christ. He didn't just stand the pulpit and preach. He didn't just stand under the olive tree and preach. He went to the people. When they were depressed, he helped them. He brought hope into their life. When the, the mother was bearing her only son, he said, no, I can't allow this to happen. He raised her from the dead. We may not be able to raise people from the dead physically, but we can raise them from the dead emotionally. We can help them, work with them before they commit suicide or before they feel too hopeless and want to give up. May God bless us. May God help us as a people that we go home. And we don't do like the four lepers. They went. They were enjoying themselves. A lot of clothes. A lot of food. Buy your page, wherever. And they didn't stay there and said, listen, Zafe yo, kite yo. They went. And they told the people, hey, we found food. Come. Hey, we found clothes. Come. Hey, we found drink. Come. God is asking us today, first of all, to go to the upper room. Sometimes we, we, we forget the upper room where we need to go and confess and forsake, and we need to seek the Lord's anointing. It is one thing to be appointed. As I said earlier, anybody can raise a hand on a committee and ask you to be appointed. But it's another thing altogether to be anointed by the Lord. So may God help us to go home now and seek the Lord's forgiveness. Seek the Lord's anointing so that God can do with the Seventh-day Adventist Church what he wants and is waiting to do among us on the island of St. Lucia. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Leos, for your message and reminding us, firstly, that God loves us. And because of his love for us, he has appointed us, once we accept the sacrifice of his son, to do certain things. And of those things that we have to do, mainly live the life for him, so that we can be the right examples to this world. Pray, but as much as we pray, also do the things that are necessary to be done in this world. As we end our service, I will ask us to stand and we are going to sing the hymn uh, 213. Jesus is coming soon. As we end, I will ask the praise team to join me. Well, not join me. I will ask the praise team to come um, <laughs> and assist us in singing the hymn 213. Thank you.
prophecy, prophetic place. And I like to come to this place. This morning, I would be the first to admit that I'm a sinner and I need God. Amen? I'll be the first to admit that I realize that it's one thing to be appointed, but it's another thing altogether to be anointed. I would also admit that God has given us a special work to do. And to do it effectively, to do it to please him, we must receive his anointing. So I want this morning to ask God to give me a double unction of his anointing. My question is, is there anybody in here this morning want to join me in asking God for that double anointing? Because you don't have to be a pastor. Never forget that. You don't have to be an elder. You don't have to be a teacher. You just have to be a servant of the Lord. And God will put people in your way, in your neighborhood, all around you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven this morning, at this midday hour, we want to thank you. We thank you for the message. Certain parts of it were probably hard for us to swallow. But we pray that you'll give us humility and grace. And we ask, dear Lord, as we raise our hands, we also raise our hearts to you, asking that you will take us and forgive us. Because truly, Lord, your word is true. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But this morning, you, what you are doing here is extending another opportunity to us, extending another invitation to us, extending another call to us, both those of us who are here in this Balata church and those who are overseas, those who are at home, in the north, in the south, in the east, in the west of the country, wherever you are, God is appealing to us today. Let us, the time has come. The time is now. The time is right when we should consecrate ourselves to God, where we should not depend just on only preaching the word, but do like Jesus did. Get the anointing and go and take care of the sick, the suffering, the depressed, the suicidal person. Take care of them, the naked, the hungry, oh, the hopeless. Father, this morning we pray that you turn us around, you forgive us, you use us to bring honor and glory to you, and particularly those of us on the island of St. Lucia, at such a time like this, when we should be out there, when we should be witnessing, when our lives should be testifying that we have been with Jesus, when our lives should be testifying that we are led by Jesus, some of us are sleeping, spiritually that is. Some of us in slumber, some of us in lodge, some are in different things that we shouldn't be in at all. We pray, dear Lord, that you come and visit us. And this morning, forgive us and save us and transform us. For if we live like the rest of sinners, we will go to hell like the rest of sinners. Thank you, O God, for your mercy and your grace. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. And let the church say, Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. Amen. We are inviting all of you back here this afternoon as we do our AY. Um, all viewers, we are back at four. We are back at four for AY this afternoon. Have a good um, Sabbath lunch and see all those who are in here and those who are viewing online for four o'clock. Those who are in, we would ask you to wait for one minute still. have been done here at the Community Services Center and we are getting ready to do our finishing works. However, in order to accomplish this, we are soliciting your assistance. I am excited, I'm elated that the CS Center is on its way to completion. But we need you, we need you, we need every one of you to ensure that this center can be completed before the end of the year. 
and many who are in need can get help. For persons wishing to contribute towards this project, we ask that you contact Pastor Lucius Philip, who is our Community Services Director at 720-6841, or you can contact me, Mariah Simon Joseph, the President of the Federation, at 719-1335. For our online viewers, we invite you to please visit our St. Lucia Mission website at stluciaadventist.org. Click on the online giving button and follow the directions after. Please indicate that your contribution will be towards the community services center which is ongoing. Thank you. Pathfinders Join us for the 5th Inter-American Division Pathfinder Camporee. Thousands of Pathfinders from across our division and around the world will be there for a spectacular event like no other. Come and feel the pulse, the vibe, and the rhythm of Jamaica. On April 48, 2023, Pathfinders in Mission Camporee will impact this Caribbean jewel for Jesus. Experience the live drama every evening about Gideon on the Lord's mission. There will be grand baptisms and testimonies of lives transformed through Christ and pathfindering. It will be exciting, adventurous, inspirational, informative. Join Pathfinders from more than 50 countries and islands for this grand camboree. There will be parades, drilling and marching competitions, and tons of other field events just for you. Come and achieve additional honors, trade pins, and be invested in another Pathfinder class. Remember, the Inter-American Division camboree happens once every five years, so you can't afford to miss this one. It's the 5th Inter-American Division Pathfinder Camporee, Pathfinders in Mission, Jamaica, April 4 to 8, 2023. Come and be inspired for mission. In all the world 